All right. <laughs> I often ask who is more excited the first day of class, the students or the teacher? Who do you think? Do you get excited coming to class? <laughs> I get excited coming to class. Do you start by saying hi? Do you start by saying hello? Or do you start by saying good morning? I usually like good morning. And why? Be because it conveys a positive thought to open the thalamic gates to the cortex. What do you think of that? You'll learn more about the thalamic gates when we study the nervous system. But that's an introduction to them. How many of you have studied anatomy before? Just a few of you, all right? And when you studied anatomy, did you introspect? Because that's the way we study this course. You're going to look at each other differently from now on. <laughs> introspect. Learn who you are beneath the surface. Because the knowledge that you'll gain here in Wheeler Auditorium in the fall of 2005 can last you your full 100 years. By then, will you geneticists extend that to 120 years? Who knows? But you will always have your anatomy with you wherever you are. So learn it well while you're here. So you can take care of yourself. So we'll cut those big health care bills the latter quarter of those 100 years. Be healthy for the whole time. Now, each year I have to find out if my class is really necessary. So I ask three questions, different questions, every year. So this time, how many of you know the structural and functional unit of the lung without which you cannot breathe? One, two, three, four. I guess we need the class for my first question. Second question. How many of you know the structural and functional unit of compact bone without which your bones would collapse? You'd just be a puddle of protoplasm there. How many know the structural and functional unit of compact bone? We do need a class, don't we? One person doesn't. <laughs> All right. Now, third question. How many of you know the structural and functional unit of the most complex mass of protoplasm on this earth. How many know the structural and functional unit? Do you know what the most complex mass of protoplasm on this earth is? What do you think it would be? A brain, sure, without a doubt. Can anybody tell me anything? more complex than the human brain. How many have never seen a human brain before? Just a few of you by now. I remember once we took one in second grade and the children said we already saw it in first grade. <laughs> we have a program where we teach in the schools, but at least they were learning about the human brain. But I want you to appreciate what you carry in the top of your heads. Because this mass only weighs three pounds, and yet it has the capacity to conceive of a universe a billion light years across. Now, isn't that phenomenal? A mass of protoplasm can do that. And yet, at the same time, it can turn around and be mad or sad or glad or any kind of an emotional expression you'd like to think about. It is a phenomenal mass. And it's housed in a human body. They have a symbiotic relationship. The brain affects the body. The body affects the brain. So I love teaching human anatomy to give you the whole picture. And then next semester, we concentrate only on the brain. But I want you to appreciate your brains. And you say, why do you put on your gloves? Well, you've always heard of formaldehyde. We used to store them in formaldehyde. We fix them in formaldehyde to initially preserve them. And then you transfer them to 70% alcohol, because alcohol will preserve the brain. 
Need I say more? <laughs> My message is clear, right? All right, so let's enjoy this unique educational journey today. You see, every day I'll put up an outline of what we intend to cover, and we put up the vocabulary that we use. And you are responsible for the vocabulary because I'll be using it. But students requested a long time ago that we write it up there so they'd have it spelled correctly to begin with. I do not give you handouts. I want you to use kinesthetic sense. This is why I stay. It's not old-fashioned. It's through years and years of studying education and how you learn. And you learn with kinesthetic sense when you write. I don't want you reading papers. You can just get a book. All right? So I want you to copy what we have up here so it's in your handwriting. And I got a letter from one of my students who's a professor at Johns Hopkins, and she said she still has her notes, and they're very clear, and she uses them. So it was very encouraging. So let's begin first by meeting somebody you don't know in class. So turn to somebody you don't know and pretend like they have no hair, pretend like they have no skull, you're going to be talking brain to brain, right? A unique experience. You wanted that here, didn't you? You've never done that before, I'm sure. So find out where the person sitting next to you is from, what your name is, and a little about them. I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> hi, since... Since you're down here, I'll get you. Oh, hi. What's your name? My name's Cynthia. Cynthia. And where are you from? I'm from the Bay Area. I'm from Lafayette. Lafayette, not too far away. Yeah. What are you studying? I'm studying molecular environmental biology. And what do you want to do with it? Um, I might go to medical school, but mm -hmm. I haven't decided yet. I might go into politics, too. Wow. Yeah. I prefer m medical school. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to be serious. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Your two minutes are up, but I hope you've made a new friend. We consider ourselves a big family here. We want you to get to know each other, and you'll find it's very useful to find a study buddy, somebody to study with after you've done the original studying, because that helps you speak the language, work together, see it from a different perspective. So after maybe a week or two, if you don't have one, let me know, and we'll ask all those who want a study buddy to meet out on the right side of the entrance here, all right? Now, you see I've got uh, two names on the board over here, and I just wonder if Kathleen Abania is here. There she is, great. How about Stephen Smug? Is it Smug or Smug? Perfect, it's Smug? Yeah. Great, do you know why your name's there? I do not. You do not. Well, Every week I take two students to lunch, and I pick the name at random. So you can tell that this has been picked at random, all right? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's a way I can keep up with what you're doing, because I catch all the new ones coming in every year, but this way I get an idea of what's popular amongst the students. So after class today, come here and we'll find a time where we go at noon to the faculty club for lunch. At 1 o'clock we stop, right? So come up <laughs> quick. All right. Now we have the format of this class. My name is Marion Diamond. and I've been teaching here for many decades <laughs> because I love to awaken students to anatomy. They so seldom have appreciated their bodies, and I just love it, so that's why I continue. I have worked at Harvard. I've taught at Cornell for four years. I've taught at UCSF. I've taught all over the world, but I come back to Berkeley. I like my Berkeley students, all right? So I have office hours. from 11 to 1 on Tuesday, Thursday, in room 5120 VLSB. 
And w with so many of us, we have to sign up. So if you really want an appointment, I put up the list on Friday. List on Friday to sign up. I should just say sheet, not list. It'll be a list after you've signed. And then you'll have your appointments on the following week. So this w is essential from experience in the past. Now, as we know, this class is 131. It's going to be human anatomy. And it will be three hours a week for 15 weeks. How long is that? 45 hours. How many hours in two days? 48. So we have class less than two days. <laughs> right? Those who signed up for 131L, you'll have class for four hours a week, so 60 hours. But for a structure that's taken millions of years to evolve, you can see we're just touching the surface. We have another class, 131A. Have you heard of 131A? That's applied anatomy. That's a one-unit course. 131A, those have already signed up for lab. Before I go to 131A, let me give you the name of the head GSI for the lab, OK? So if you have anything to do with lab, you contact him. This is Matt Brandley. And his email is brandley at berkeley.edu. So he'll take care of anything to do with 131L. 131A is applied anatomy, where we have former students who are professionals one way or another in the medical field and health field. And they come and talk about their field, how they applied, what they did, and what they do as a profession. I mean, we have neurosurgeons, we have neuro, we have, oh, radiologists, forensic medicine, healthy buildings, all sorts of people coming to talk for 131A. It does not begin until September 17th, and it will be Friday at noon in. Um, where is it? 10 Davis Hall. But the students love it. There's no exam. You write a paper at the end of two pages long, and that's it. But I want you to know the personal lives of health related, of people in health related careers to help you choose what you want to do. Now, the books that we require for this course, there are Two that we require. We have one for gross anatomy. Which is by Mariab, Mariab. You'll find I repeat a lot because that helps with your protein synthesis and remembering. So I do it purposely, right? So Mariab et al. It's called Human Anatomy. And it's the fourth edition. Students are already asking, can they use the third? Sure, you can use the third, but the fourth is more updated. So make your choice. The other one is microscopic anatomy. And this one is Wheaters. Wheaters. Functional, functional histology, histology. And that's also a fourth edition, a superb book. I don't know that it has a peer. So those two are, are required, recommended, may sound strange to you, just one of them. It's called the Human Anatomy Coloring Book. 
You said you colored in kindergarten. But again, it's the kinesthetic sense of coloring in the muscles, where they originate, where they attach. It helps embed the knowledge. So it's the human brain coloring book. And that's the third edition. And there are many of these out, but by far the one that has the best text is Caput and Elson. Elson was a former student here. Guess how many copies this has sold? How would you like to be author of a book that has sold four million copies? That's what Larry's book has done. It's good. Students enjoy it all over the world. All right? So now we have our exams. Whoops. We have three exams, each worth 30%, 33%, we should say, or let's just say a third. Each worth one third of points, total points. And the exams will only cover what I give in lecture. There is so much work. You use your books to enrich, to understand, to see other dimensions. But I'll only cover on exam what I give in lecture. Only exams cover lecture. And we grade by percentage, and we've never had any problems. Over the years, if you get 90% and above, you get an A. If you get 80% and above, a B, 70%, and so forth. But it's a very clear way, and it's lasted us well. We do consider growth curves because frequently many of you have had a lot of biology, and some of you have had none. So you don't do too well on the first exam but say you do poorly, but then you do very well, then you do very well, and you get something like a 79% total. If I see that growth curve, we look at all of your grades, all 750 of you. We look at every single grade at grading time at final to see whether you've improved. If you get a 79, then we'll take you up to the 80%. It has to be on the margin between the two to move you. But we do consider it, so it doesn't mean that means you can slack for the first exam. But in case that happens, you could let, work it up. Now, many people say anatomy is only vocabulary. So we look at terminology now. But when you take a French course, do you say that French is only vocabulary? <laughs> sure it is. If you're going to speak the language of the body, you need to know the terminology, right? Because no two cells in the brain are alike. Clusters of cells have different names. We need to learn them. But that's the fun of it. Because most of the tissues and structures of the body are from either Greek or Latin. How many have had Greek and Latin? Isn't that amazing? My mother had nine years of Greek and eight years of Latin way back when she went to Cal in the early 1900s. How it's just been removed from the system almost. It's amazing. So we're going to go back and learn a little. The first, what is the meaning of the word anatomy? It's a Greek word. Have you ever asked yourself, what does anatomy mean? We break it up. It's Greek. And Anna deals with up. And Tommy is from 
tem nian, just to give the Greek word, it's not the same, but that's what it comes from, and that just means to dissect. So essentially, one is going to dissect the body to see the various parts. But you'll find that looking at terminology and finding the derivation can be fun. So terminology, derivation, it helps you remember. So we're going to just take six words. Let's take artery. Everybody's heard of an artery. What does your artery do for you? Carries oxygenated blood, right? But in Latin, what does artery mean? It means air holder. Air holder. Why? Because with the last contraction of the heart, the blood goes out through all the arteries, so the cadaver has no blood in the arteries. So the early individuals looked at this and said, well, it must hold air. Interesting. Makes an artery dynamic for you when you see an empty artery in a cadaver. So in Latin, artery means air holder. Let's take another word. Genitals. Genitals. You can figure that one out. Genitals. Where did that name come from? From Genesis. What does Genesis mean? Birth. Let's take another one. Just want to make it fun when you look at words and try to figure out how they came about. They only had dead bodies to look at to see blood flow or anything in those days. What's another one? Let's take carotid. What's the carotid? Does anybody know? The arteries in your neck taking the blood to your brain, the carotid arteries in neck, take blood to brain. So what's carotid mean? It means stupor, stupor. So if you press on your carotids, you reduce the blood flow to your brain and you go into a stupor, <laughs> right? So never take your pulse from your carotid arteries. Take it from your radial artery here. You don't cut the brain supply, right? But that's fun of carotid. Let's take the uterus. What does uterus mean? How many here have a uterus? <laughs> How many have ever asked, what does the word uterus mean? Hmm? Uterus. Uterus means hysteria. <laughs> That's what the early anatomists thought. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? How far we've come? Hysteria means excess anxiety, right? So much for that. What's the uterus do, really? <laughs> do you think it causes you all that excess anxiety? Or do you think it houses the growing individual, right? It's where the baby grows. Baby develops. 
Let's try another one. We said we had six. Let's try five. Let's take femur. Most of you have heard of femur. What is the femur? It's the largest bone in your body. Where is it? It's your thigh bone. Sure. So femur means thigh. So you know immediately we're in this. We'll study it in detail, but right now we're just seeing its derivation. And since we've taken one organ associated with reproduction from the female, let's take one from the male. Let's take the penis. What does penis mean? No guesses? You'll be really surprised. Tail. <laughs> sort of had their directions mixed, didn't they? <laughs> Gives you something to think about. But I bet you, you won't find anybody at lunch who knows what penis means. <laughs> All right, but the fun of learning terminology. Look it up if you don't know and want to know, because once you know, you never forget it. All right? Now, what kind of techniques do we use to study anatomy? As we've said, we use gross anatomy and we use histology. Techniques to study. Gross anatomy. And that is studying the body with the naked eye. And you'll learn we have lots of shorthand. In medical terms, a C with a line over it means with. Okay, we use it all the time, and we'll be using shorthand. So gross anatomy with naked eye. With microscopic anatomy, We can study with a light microscope up to a thousand times magnification. A light microscope. A thousand times mag. Or with an electron microscope, electron microscope, over 30,000 times magnification. And there are different kinds of electron microscopes to help study the body. We have what's called a transmission EM, we abbreviate electron microscope, just EM. So we have a transmission EM, where the electrons pass through the tissue. Electrons pass through tissue. And I write things on the board because it gives you a chance to think. If I just flash a slide up there, you have no time to put it in what you, we call your association cortex. So by the time you write it out, you can remember it. Then we have scanning EM. And scanning EM, in contrast, Transmission EM is just TEM when you see that abbreviation. Scan EM is SEM. And it just scans the surface of the tissue. It's beautiful. I'll show some pictures of your taste buds of scanning EM. Beautiful. Scans surface 
of tissue. So lots of equipment has been developed over the year to keep refining our approach to studying. And these techniques which I've mentioned here are all used with dead tissue. This is all dead tissue here. And with light EM, these are all dead tissue. But more recently, all of the technology has been dealing with living tissue. So we have what's called the nuclear magnetic resonance imaging with live tissue. An N MR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and that will give you the anatomy of your body. They do the leg bones, or skull, whatever. This is for anatomy. But then we can have what's called functional nuclear magnetic resonance. Functional NMR. What is that then? It's combining the physiology and the anatomy. Physiology and anatomy, the function. And they can do that by picking up the amount of oxygen in the vessels. So if you have a very active, for me to be speaking to you now, my motor speech area is firing. It will have much more oxygen going through it than the area where I'm supposed to be sleeping, right? So that's or a functional MNR, and I'll give one more PET. PET is positron emission tomography. Positron emission tomography. Emission, it should be, excuse me. Emission tomography. So those of you who are in bioengineering are interested in these pieces of equipment, designing better ones so we can get better images of our anatomy. And in PET, you're using radioactive material to localize radioactive material to localize whatever you're looking for. I'll just leave it at that. How many has had, had a PET scan? No, one. Was it glucose? Glucose, what, what uh, radioactivity did they give you? You don't know? No, you'll find out. Then you tell us, all right? then we all learn. No, if you find things that you know we don't know, <laughs> we're a class, right? We talk. So now we have structural planes and directions. We're going through this at a, at a superficial but rapid rate. And uh, it's important to know the terms for positions so you can tell relationships of structures one to another. You will learn these directions in the body. So let's call these, what terms did we use to give this group? We call it structural planes and directions.
first we have to know the anatomical position of the body that we're going to be referring to. So the anatomical position of the body is face forward, palms forward. So when we start doing relationships, we have to be in this position. Not this position, not this position, but face forward, palms forward. The anatomical position. And as we learn, you'll see why this is so important. Face forward and palms up. So let's make a cartoon. Head, neck, shoulders, trunk. Arm out here. Here's the general idea. If we make a line straight through the body, that's called a midline cut midline. And if we're talking about a structure that's going to be here versus a structure that's going to be here, we will say that A is medial to B. It's closer to the midline. A is medial to B. And we will say that B is lateral to A. B is lateral to A. So if you're describing some of the GI tract and you've got the tissues that you want to be talking about, you use medial and lateral to help orient you. Then we use the terms proximal and distal. Proximal, proximal and distal. And this part of my body is the trunk. These are my extremities. So proximal is closer to the trunk. Closer to trunk. Distal, then, is away from trunk. So these are terms we'll be using all the time with these appendages that we attach to this trunk. So if I have a C here, at the shoulder, and a D down here, I will say that C is proximal to the midline. D, which would be out here, is distal to the midline. When we go to put on muscles, we're going to have insertions and origins. You're going to have the insertions are proximal. Excuse me, the origin is proximal, the insertion is distal. So we'll be using these terms all the time. I have a few slides I'd like to show. I have a few words, but I, I'll cover those later. But let's try to review some of the things we've said with slides each day. Whoops. Do I have a, my pointer? Is, it, is this it? They get fancier and smaller all the time. Let's see what this does. This may be a clock. It may be a radio. I don't know. We'll see. There we go. It's got one. All right. We had mentioned an artery. This we'll learn. Our thoracic aorta coming down. This is as we'll see it from a structural point of view. This is gross anatomy of this vessel. 
If we look at it histologically, we look at the next slide. This is what it looks like histologically. We look at its wall. This is its opening where the blood flows, but this is its wall. These wavy little things are what we call elastic fibers. Every time your heart contracts, your blood vessels coming from it will expand, and then they recoil. So we'll get the principle of what's going on by looking at the growth structure and then the microscopic structure to understand the dynamics at this level. In the next slide. Now, we were talking about medial and lateral. Does anybody know what muscle this is? Pectoralis major. Well, this will be the origin. It's medial. It's close to the midline. It will insert over here on the humerus, which is distal. Here's your deltoid. It originates here. That's closer to the midline. And will insert down here. So we need to know medial lateral, proximal, distal. This is closer, this is proximal, distal. So we'll be using these terms all the time in bones, muscles, and so forth. In the next one, well, this is a bone. Would you call it a long bone or a short bone? Good for you. It's a long bone. When you look at the femur, you know that's really a long bone, but the characteristics of it are the same. Short bones have different characteristics from long bones. So I put this one in just to show you that these metacarpals forming the palm of your hand, these are long bones. But now if you want to look at a beautiful picture, look at them histologically. Next one. Isn't that gorgeous? The art of science. That's one reason I loved anatomy, because I like the art. But this is taking a section through that bone. And this is what you have millions of these in your long bones. With the blood vessel here, the bone cells here, they've got to get nutrients. Some people think that anatomy is dead. In our class where we go off and teach the little kids, kindergarten to seventh grade, we tell them to teach their parents. So this little kid went home and told his mother that bones were alive. Mother said, no, they're not. So a little kid came crying back and said to my student, you told me wrong. So we had to Xerox out of the book so the parent could see that bones are alive, very much alive. They grow with use. They shrink with disuse. Muscles grow with use, shrink with disuse. What other structure, very important structure, grows with use and shrinks with disuse? The one in the hot box. That's why we teach. Now, here's a picture cut through the skull. Have you ever seen your body like this before? Isn't that an interesting trip? You can imagine, look this evening, open your mouth, look in your mirror, go back and see your uvula. Know that if you go through your vertebral column, you'll come to the spinal cord. Then you go up your spinal cord and imagine your cerebellum, your pons, all your brain structures, your big corpus callosum. We're going to learn all of this. But see, it took a dead body to get this picture. Let's look at an MMR. Uh, NMR. Next one. They do pretty well, don't they? This is when we call them MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. It's the same, but it's a sagittal section through. Here's your corpus callosum, just as you saw it with death. Here's the cerebellum. Here's the pons. Here is the spinal cord. Isn't that good? But they're trying to improve the resolution at all times. But they've done very well at the present time. So that, I think, gives you an introduction